And um, we want to just take a quick look at um, of first verse 5, Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind or in reality this attitude be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay? <clears throat> which goes along with verse uh to fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind, one mind. Let this mind, let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who went to the cross and did so in a certain way. And this, and when he says, when, you know, basically the, the meaning is, let this mind be in you that was in Jesus that went to the cross. But again, it is not talking about the event. It's not talking about the event, but the pattern, or more importantly, the essence of being. The essence of being. And this is real, real important. That's why I took the time to chart it out here. The original is God. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. There wasn't anything else. And he created the heavens and the earth, and he created all this stuff. So there is what, what I term the original. I mean the original, original. There wasn't nothing before him. There is, there is uh, anything that's going to come after, him, after the original is not going to be the original unless it is the original. Uh, in other words, it's not going to be Christ unless it's Christ. Okay? And, and if it's Christ... Or if it's the original, because I'm not, I'm trying to, in a sense, stay away from the terminology we're so used to, Jesus, Christ, going to the cross, because we're not talking about the event, but we're talking about the original as, as relating to him and the pattern of the original within us. Okay, so we're, start, we're, so we're starting with just trying to communicate uh, this and when I wrote the original, I'm talking about his being, not his doing. Yes, his his being produces doing, and that's what Philippians 2, starting with the verse 5, or starting with verse 6, actually begins to describe the pattern of being that we call God. The pattern of selflessness that we call the Lamb. Whatever terminology you want to use, you can go to any number of terminologies, the important thing is to not just go to terminology. The important thing is don't just learn terminology. If you don't understand something, pursue it with all your heart, you know. And the goal isn't even to understand, now, you know, let me make that clear. The goal isn't to understand my terminology. The goal is to understand what the Lord wants to communicate. And, and let's hope that my terminology, it, terminology is at least <coughs> coming from a place of the original or the place of God's being because that's what Philippians 2 is talking about. It is not talking about doing on your part. It is talking about a pattern that you'll do, but that pattern is produced by the being of God in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the terminology we use. We all know it. And we've ridden it to the ground, and he's, you know, fallen under us, and we're still beating it. But we need to find the truth of it. We need to find the Christ of it. We need to find and discover him within us as our being. Um, uh, you know, and, and I don't want to go off too much on it, but I mean, <clears throat> like Ephesians 1, he says... Jesus went and died on the cross, that we might be to the praise of his glory. Now, everybody reads that and says that we might praise his glory. It doesn't say to praise his glory. It says that we might be something, not do something. And there are so many scriptures that will communicate that reality, but we miss it because we're all about doing for God and glorifying God apart from Christ, the being of God, being in us. Be ye holy. Not do holiness. Be ye holy. Why? On what premise? For I am. I am is a being term. 
And all of those things do not pertain to a Christian religion, folks. My God, they pertain to Christ. And they pertain specifically, not just generally or, you know, they pertain to Christ in us. So any religion that we form around the scriptures and call it God or of God, if it's not emanating from this reality of the original, you know, in the beginning was the Word, was Word, Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were created by Him, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's the original, in the beginning. You see that? That's the original. Okay, so, so the original is understood, or should be understood on our part in terms of being, which I call, my terminology, the eternal essence. The essence of God, not just figuring out some of the things that he did when he walked the earth and trying to copy that. But, but uh, for some reason, the word osmosis comes to my mind, where there is a partaking of, there's a participation, and, and you get that in different, I mean, Peter referred to that, says that we have become partakers of the divine nature. Folks, that's the original who is allowing us to partake of him in terms of his being and not just, you know, I mean, we, you, you, you could have a bride and she'd not be anything like you or with you or whatever, but the being of Jesus is in this bride. That's who she is. Do you understand that? That's, she's not, she's bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. She's not some sort of a stranger or whatever. Uh, eternal essence. Okay, so this isn't, this isn't God under a magnifying glass in certain situations. You see why I said that? Because eternal is ever ongoing. It's not, it's not trying to figure him out. It's trying to decrease and allow him to increase with maybe little knowledge of him. And I, you, I've seen this. I know you have too. I've met people who know nothing about the revelation of Christ, know nothing of the deeper knowledge of the Lord, but they've got Jesus living in them. And I mean, you, you'd have to be a liar to not admit it. My God, that's Jesus in that person. Well, guess how, how he got in there? Not by knowledge, but by essence. By essence. Somebody was hungry for God, not the things of God. And that's, that's where it leads. Okay, so having understood this, then the original or the essence of God was manifest at Calvary. And I, I particularly put the word Calvary there, referring to a hill far away, <laughs> you know. So that we know 2,000 years ago, the eternal essence of God manifested right here on Calvary. All right. But then along comes Paul after Calvary, never saw it physically. We have no record of Paul ever seeing, even though he was alive at that time, or ever being aware of any of those events. And the strange thing is, he really doesn't bring it up. For example, Philippians. He's not bringing it up because he's seen something beyond it. He's seen the essence that created it. Does that make sense? So my little chart over here, three crosses on a hill, which is not just wood. Sorry. Which is not just wood. This thief, this one, that. The other two guys, and, and let's see, I, I think I have something written on that, but who knows. Um, oh, yeah. Well, let me just read this. What makes the cross of Christ different from the other two crosses on Calvary? Because they're all on a hill called Mount Calvary. They're all on Golgotha. Right? I mean, why couldn't one of these other guys start his re own religion? And say, I hung on a cross on Golgotha. I hung on a cross 
on Calvary's hill. Why, why couldn't he? Well, he could. He could. But Jesus, his cross is different. And what, what was the... It's not the wood or the nails, but the essence of the person. The two thieves who hung on either side of Jesus were punished by the cross. They were punished by the cross. They were punished by the cross upon which they hung, but Jesus was a willing sacrifice. Not just as an act of his will, but by his eternal essence. Ah, well, see, now there... We can only go back so far, you know, unless the Holy Spirit take us by the hand and take us past just uh, using our will to follow God. Well, Jesus did. He chose to be a living sacrifice. Well, he did. He chose that. But guess what? That is what he is. He is a lamb. He is a lamb slain from before, from before the found, from before the foundation of the world. So we're already outside of human will and decision making and all of that in the sense of that's what he was then, you know. However, uh, if you understand any of the things that I have been sharing, which you know, you'll understand that God. God gives him that choice anyway, because that's just the way God is. You know. He gives us a choice. But, uh, but all doesn't rest on our will, because, I mean, isn't the will part of the, the, the soul? And what is the soul made up of, Jim? Mind, will, and emotions. Wait a minute. Will is right in there with emotion. Same substance, just functions different. Just like three and one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit functioning in different manners. One is the Father, one is the Son, one is the guide and the comforter, all of the same substance. Soul is the same thing. So my God, we got to get past, you know, I mean, much of Christianity still talks about getting their soul saved a long time ago when they accepted Jesus. Peter doesn't talk about that. He says he talks about being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth. It's the only that's the only word that's going to get you out of the soul and into Him who dwells in your spirit. But it does it doesn't matter, you know. That. Okay, so so I want to finish this off. The original being His eternal essence, His manifested Calvary was manifested Calvary. But here, sometime later, Paul begins to see this same Jesus. And in chapter 3, which we will not get to at all. In fact, tonight's the last two classes, right? Um, He totally follows this pattern in chapter 3. And I mean totally, totally. He saw this reality of the essence of God. And he pursued the Lord in his essence and not the doctrinal teaching to become some scholarly, religious person. Y'all did get this, didn't you? I mean, it's, it's honestly, you know, we go, okay, well, you know, well, at least we're sincere. Well, so were the Pharisees, you know? Sincerely wrong, sincerely without Jesus, sincerely following God without what God gives. The essence of his being to us. Imparting the divine nature that you might be partakers of the divine nature. Did I mention that earlier? Peter said that. That we might participate such a huge, glorious, glorious word. Okay. Um, So Jesus was a willing sacrifice, not just as an act of his will, but by his eternal essence. He made the cross upon which he hung special and not the other way around. 
because it's not like these two pieces of wood put up in the middle were special wood. And when Jesus got on it, everything was glorious. No. It was wood. It remained wood. You know. And, you know, there are people in certain denominations and religions that believe they have splinters from the cross. And they keep them in these sacred places so they won't disenter. Yeah, no, no, that, that's absolutely, you know. And see, that's the problem with the church. All we got out of the cross was a splinter. <laughs> you know, instead of dying on the thing, we just go, oh, I got a splinter from the cross. I'm suffering for, no, you're not. You're, you know, that's suffering as you. Anyway, all right, let's read verses 9 through 11 because I have a feeling you'd like to get on to resurrection. <clears throat> Verse 9, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of of God the Father. <clears throat> All right, so this is the resurrection, folks. Do you understand that there had to be a death before there was a resurrection, right? You can't be resurrected unless you were dead first. Where is the death? Where is it in where he's talking about here? Well, verse 8 and 7 and 6, right? In other words, the death is actually preceding the resurrection here, okay? But remember that the death is eternal essence or selflessness. Are you following? It's actually, so, so you can never leave that. Okay, so what's the explanation then? How do, we, how do we figure this thing out? It's so confusing. I mean, there's death and there's resurrection. Just call them what they are. There's death over there and resurrection over here. No, 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 no. Death is the lamb. The resurrection is Christ. I am the resurrection. But you see, if that, if, if the self-giving to the point of death, even to the point of death, and that's what it said, didn't it? It said that he gave himself even unto death, even the death of the cross, okay? So this selflessness, self gives, even to death, even to the death of the cross. It'll go that. It'll it. It is that's its nature is what it's trying to communicate. Can you can you see that? So what's the explanation of the resurrection? Well, just let's just take a quick picture in the book of Revelation. And what do we do? We see the resurrected Jesus. You know, John is standing there and. You know, and, and they're just going, nobody's able to open the seals. Oh, and everybody's weeping in heaven, you know, because we got a problem in heaven. Nobody can open the seals to the book. Nobody can really understand the book. How do we open the seals and, and figure it out? And, and somebody says, you know, one of the angels, I think it was, says, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah hath you know, won the victory and everything. And he turns to see the lion of the tribe of Judah and he sees a lamb as though it had been saying, slain, sitting upon the throne. Okay? There is the death and the resurrection as one. It's the best picture it could give you. It's interesting. I mean, it's interesting to me. <laughs> That the picture of Jesus, even as a lamb, isn't some healed lamb where he's all healed and he's sitting on the throne and he's grown his horns now and he's got a shield and a, you know, and he goes, there's the one who has conquered because he didn't conquer by that. Through death he destroyed him that had the death, the power of death, that is the devil. Okay? And... I, I'm crucified to the world, the world unto me, and he that is dead is freed from sin, and every other thing was conquered by a, a slain lamb, a helpless, selfless, sweet, <laughs> slain lamb. 
and all that are around that throne are worshiping that. Make no mistake, just because everybody isn't doing it now, just because people don't get it when you talk about it, doesn't mean that all that will, will. All right, so that's, that's the picture. And notice in verse 9 begins with the word wherefore. Because he went into death, even that much death wherefore, or the reason, that being the reason upon which we are now going to express the resurrection, wherefore God hath highly exalted him. All right. Now, you don't need a whole lot of explanation to comprehend this simple truth. We all have heard it. We've read several scriptures. Jesus said it. It's in the book of James, I think, in several different places. It says, if you, if you exalt yourself, you're going to be brought down. But if you humble yourself, God will raise you up, right? All right. That sounds so simple. We make that a religious little treatsy thing, you know. Okay. All right. Well, I'm just going to. That's death and resurrection. That's essence put in simple words for dummies like you and me. You know, I mean, really, that's, that's it, you know. Well, if you exalt yourself, okay. Well, guess what? If you're you, you're going to exalt yourself. And even when you humble yourself, you'll be exalting yourself or at least trying to. Okay, well, that's human nature, you know. Nobody gets marked off for that. You get marked out. Because that we will do that, and we will never change. Ultimately, we can go. We can get good for a while. We can. We can. We all can do better. And all these sermons about we'll try harder and do better are ridiculous. Because you are also essence, but you're not eternal essence. You're stinky essence. <laughs> That's what you are, and that's what I am, and that's who we are. And there's only one hope for us, and that's the cross. And there's only one hope after the cross, and that's the Christ. That's the, this, that is for us to partake of the original. It's, it's the only way. It's the only way. And so, buried in this little seed that Jesus communicated... If you seek to exalt yourself, you'll be brought down. But if you humble yourself, I will raise you up. Is the fullness of the essence of God. It's just right there. Now, the Holy Spirit has to open your eyes, or you'll just see it as a little, this is what we do. We're Christians. Yeah. No Jesus, no essence, just, well, I'm following his word, you know. Well, you know, Jesus said, if any man follow me, take up the cross. The first act of following him is the cross. Deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow me. You know, well, we don't, we don't get that. We don't go with that. We don't see that because we don't, we don't see him in his essence. We don't. We, we can be taught that, we can read about it in books, we can read about it in the Bible, but until that has been communicated by impartation, we will be what we are. And, you know, and, and you see, see I, I'm never confused why people get upset around here after, you know, their first year. First year is usually good. Not necessarily for everyone, but but it eventually it's like, this is hard. I don't like this. You know? Well, no, you you wouldn't. And and you know, I've said it over and over, and I don't want you to. I don't want you to have to put up with this. If you don't see the Christ of this thing, if you don't see the living God of this thing, you know. Don't try it, you know. Jesus is a trained professional. Don't try this at home, okay? <laughs> but we're all trying, you know. 
and, and many of us are even just trying to copy him. We're trying to look like him when it's still us. Well, that's called counterfeit. That's not the coin. God doesn't trade in that. He doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't trade in that. He's not fooled, and he's not fooling with you. <laughs> you know? You think, oh, God's with me because I look so... No, he's not. You're with you. And once you figure it out, and you know, when I say, you know, when I say that, he's not with you as essence. You know, he may send somebody along to help you fix your flat at Walmart. But is that really the God you want? You know, it's like, you know, help, Lord. Yes, boss. That's what he says to you. Yes, boss. All right. So, um, Jesus was not just raised from the dead, but exalted to Lord of all based upon his humiliation. Now, there's so much into that that I don't, you know, I just, I, I could take the next two hours talking about that. Um, he was exalted to Lord of all as a resurrected man who walked the way God wanted, letting the Father, letting God be in him and do the things and, and also by, you know, being the express image of God in terms of selflessness, even the death of the cross. Okay. Therefore, he humbled himself and he humbled himself low. Therefore, he was raised up high. Make sense? I mean, I like the way this is worded. God hath, wherefore God hath all, hath God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus. Wait a minute. When did he get that name? I thought he got that, you know, 33 and a half years earlier. But Herod didn't bow his knee. In fact, Herod tried to kill him. And the Pharisees later on didn't bow their knee. They tried to kill him. And everybody in Nazareth didn't bow their knee. They actually tried to kill him. If you don't remember that part, try to throw him off a cliff. You know? Well, they're not bowing their knee, and he's got the name. Je what's your, you know, somebody says, what's his name? Jesus. They don't go, oh, oh, Abi Gabi, no Skoda Magoda. You know? They don't go into some weird thing. I don't know. It doesn't have any effect on them. Until, until he has gone to the deepest depths of selflessness above anything anyone ever could or would do. And God exalts what? A man. There's one, one mediator between God and man. The man? Jesus Christ. Didn't say, the son of God, you know. See, we, there's a lot that we miss on that, and so I said I wasn't going to go into all that, and I went further than I wanted to. Um, but this act is an, an example uh, on his ongoing way. The way is the way of selflessness that always leads to God exalting. Okay? God has, according to the makeup of his own being, Chosen this death-resurrection pattern as the pattern that all that are his should function by. So, all right? So being oneness, the original manifest at Calvary, that wasn't good enough. Now, years later, manifest in Paul, that's not good enough. If you're going to be of God, he wants it to manifest in the church at Philippi, in the church. There's your, there's your ongoingness of what I was talking about. That, the, that it, it's never going to end. God will never get um, distracted by something shiny. Jesus is it for him. <laughs> there's not going to be any, you know, little marching band coming down the street and he's going, oh, look. You know, not a bunch of little... Clowns in a circus, oh, you know, and oh, that's neat. No, he doesn't think it's neat. He doesn't think all the clowning is neat. He doesn't think the little circus acts that we've worked up are neat. 
He thinks his son, he's, he's highly exalted him and made him above all and everything. And, and he is the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega, the A to Z. Well, what else is there? In the alphabet, there's nothing else. That's it. God's alphabet, God's currency, and God's mind, all of this comes down to the original being in us, or we're outside the camp in the sense of, not outside the camp in the sense of Hebrews, but outside God's reality as he wants us to have it. All right. Um, <clears throat> this is God's way of exalting what humbles itself. It is part of his makeup and a major principle by which he operates. It is him and not something he does. And that's just important, but I mean, it's him. This is him functioning by essence when he exalts something that humbles, humbles itself. This is, this, is, this is a him thing, not a what he did thing. So, um, <clears throat> In the same manner of the coin, he brings pride down, for it is the opposite of his currency. He will not trade in it. He, he will bring pride down. He always does. He always will. That's, you know, he maybe doesn't do it instantly, but he does bring it down. We say, you know, we, we build up pride because, you know, and there's a lot to be said on that too, because... You know, we get away with a lot of stuff, and then we think that we're going to get away with it forever, and we're not. We will not, we will not, God will bring pride down. It's his makeup. It's not just a rule. It's not, it's not the judgment of God. It is the way of his being. That's a big, di that's a huge difference. And it's not God being special towards someone when he exalts them because they went into death. It's not. It's not God. Be, it's God being God. What can we do? <laughs> and angels go, what can he do? That's God. <laughs> so he exalts that, you know. Anyway. All right. It is his way, and he wants it to become our way. <clears throat> Every knee shall bow is not just an act of worship but us bowing to it as the way and making it our own. In other words, the bowing is bowing to the, not just that he's got exalted. That's not what it's saying. It's, you know, it's, um, the, uh, it's bowing to, uh, he thought it not a thing to be exploited, to be equal with God, he went ahead and made himself of no reputation. See, a lot of times God has to bring us down so, you know what I'm talking about. God has to work and bring circumstances that finally bring us down, but that's nothing like Jesus. That's bad stuff happens so much and so often and so powerful that we're just knocked down going, okay. Okay, you're gone. <laughs> you know, we, but, you know, we're going, oh, I feel so good. <laughs> and it's just a bunch of us, you know. It's not like Jesus who made himself of no reputation. So all of this, he made in the form of a servant, he self-enslaved himself. He just wasn't a servant. He self-enslaved himself. I can't express that. I don't have enough time. But... He self-enslaved himself for the good of others and went down lower still and humbled himself even under obedience and then obedience to death and then death to the cross. Wherefore these knees are bowing. They are honoring this way. They are honoring this essence. Does anybody see that? It's not some, you know, it, it'd be, it's like this. Okay, well... Um, you have all these Egyptians, and when, when Joseph was among them living in Potiphar's house, 
Uh, I didn't think much of him, and, you know, I mean, he was all right, but, you know, no big deal. But when he got thrown in prison, well, he probably deserved that and all this kind of stuff. And maybe even if someone else got thrown in there, you know, like Scott was talking about the baker or the butcher or the Indian chief or whoever all the people were there, if they're, if they're in there putting him down and stuff like that, but then, oh, my God, he's taken out of the prison, he's exalted, and then everybody goes, woo -hoo! You see what I mean? Potiphar, his wife, and they're doing it because this guy's got all the stuff and we better be careful. It's all selfish. The hands raised, the glorious, oh, you know, there's nothing. When you see the essence at the cross and you bow down, that's when it means something. That's when it means something, and it doesn't, and all this other stuff, we think it means something. We think it's really great that every knee is bowing, things of heaven and things of earth and things under the earth, but the truth is only that which comprehends the essence of God will ever even know what to bow to. In reality, in the heart, you understand what I'm saying? In the heart. So Paul is trying his best. I mean, what a wonderful presentation. He's trying his best to bring the church, the Philippians, these Philippians, into the original that was before. This is before Philippi existed. This is before the Roman Empire existed. This is before the earth existed. This is the original. And he's seen it, and he's... He, he saw it to such, in such a manner that he wanted to pattern his life after it, but he found out the only way to pattern your life after it is by the original because we're selfish. So he preached Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so we, we find this desire for us to turn to him in this way, signaled in Isaiah 55, 22, and 23. And we don't have time to turn there, um, but this is where this verse and these verses in Philippians came from. <clears throat> and uh, it, it is uh, echoing this thing of every knee shall bow um, uh, there in verse 23. And, uh, and it's all on the same premise of that. But there it's talking about in, in Isaiah 45, He's saying every niche about it. He says, turn unto me. Well, Paul saw, read Isaiah 45 and got Philippians out of it. And the turn unto him was turn unto the selfless, this, this thing that, uh, that, that uh, do regard others. Don't put yourself first sort of pattern. And that's what he calls turning unto me. That's his interpretation of those scriptures. See, why? why? Why would that make sense to Paul? Because any turning to God that is not the original is going to go back eventually. The book of Judges proves that. It's just the way it is. We'll do good for a while. But you will get bored. Well, let me tell you, when you have the original in you, when you have the eternal essence, you don't get bored because it's not you. And the Father's never bored with the Son, and the Son's never bored with the being of God. Amen. It's not going to happen. All right. Um, so to truly comprehend the Lord requires that we comprehend that his exaltation and resurrection are all due to to willingly enslaving himself, though innocent, being treated as a criminal. With the intent of helping others. It's not just, you know, being known as a criminal. You know, well, you, if you wanted to, if that was the goal, we all just get a gun, go out here and rob everybody. We'd be known as a criminal. We, oh, praise God, we're of God. No. No, he willingly enslaved himself and went this way 
for God and for others and the benefit of others. <clears throat> All right, so, um, uh, and to call him Lord then, every knee should bow, every tongue, is to give full acknowledgement to the, 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 the validity of the process. He thought it not a thing to be exploited, that he was equal with God. I will not take advantage of my advantages. I have rights. I will not use, I, no, the true, true understanding is I have rights. I will use my right to not use my right. I don't know if y'all can comprehend that, you know, because I've said every kind of weird stuff for all these years. But it really, there is, there is, the, it, within the scope of this being that we're talking about, within the scope of this pattern that begins to work in us by life, there is, there is this selfless, there is this self-giving where I was going there. To give validity to this process is encapsulated in the words that every tongue will confess him as Lord. Him. Is that... The, the, they're confessing the lordship of the one who God made Lord based on the premise that God exalts on. He was so selfless. He was exalted. He was, he was more selfless than any being. Now he is exalted above every being. Okay? To bow your knee to that is not to say, I acknowledge that God is sovereign and he chose to make his son because he's, you know, he believes in nepotism or something, you know, to make his son uh, uh, Lord. And doggone it, if God said he's Lord, we better bow our knees. Is that a little bit of sort of what we've been fed? Anybody? Isn't that sort of along the line? That's not even close. That's not even in the realm of this knee going down and saying, oh, my God, and this tongue confessing. That is lordship. That's what God exalts. That's the coin. That's the currency God exchanges in with us or, or exchanges in nothing. And what are we doing then? If we don't know the exchange, if we don't know the true value, the validity of this thing, then we just go, oh God, oh God, the church needs more life. Well, if that's true, then the church and, or the ones praying that need to go into more death. It's just that simple. But you have to see that by the essence of God or it's just words and really sort of, uh, I don't know, pushy commands that we should go into death. Well, I don't want anybody to go into death. No, none of you, unless you see the Lord. I'd rather you just go skipping out of here and just go, you know, do whatever you want, including as far as you want to go. Because it doesn't make any difference if you're being really good and going to church and giving and doing all of those kind of things if it's not Christ as opposed to doing this other stuff. My true desire for you is that with everything within your being, you cry out not, not because you're going through something, but because something resonates within your being for the truth of God and a hunger like a deer after the water brooks and says, I cannot live unless this reality be in me and you bow your knee to it and you start confessing it. 
And it seems to me like Romans 10 says that's how this thing begins to take hold. We call it salvation, but most people's terminology of salvation is simply not going to hell. So I can't go there. <clears throat> ah. Um, so I, I, I read this, and to call him Lord is to give full acknowledgement to the, the validity of the process. This is the faith. I think we studied that in Hebrews, didn't we? What the faith was. Didn't we go to Hebrews 11 and see that every single person that was there, was God was acknowledging and exalting them because they had faith, and the faith that they had was it not every time tied specifically to them going into death so that others may get resurrection. Anybody remember that? If you remember that, raise your hand. Okay, five of you. Praise God. No, that's for those on the camera, that's actually good. We only have six people here. So. <clears throat> All right. The pattern for Christian living is selflessness for God and for others. Therefore, our lives must involve, and I get this, if that's the pattern, therefore, our lives must involve suffering, humiliation, and death. Okay, now, see, you can go, you can go a lot of bad places with that. But your life as a Christian does not have to involve what did I call it? Suffering, humiliation, and death at all. In fact, I'm pretty sure there's a whole bunch of Christians who don't go through that. Okay. But we're not talking about being a Christian here, are we? We're talking about if the pattern of this reality of the original gets down into the church. If the pattern of the original gets into the church because the original is in the church then they will become selfless to the point of death on the cross. They'll accept the death on the cross and walk as Christ walked for the good of others. Is that true? Yes. Okay. Now, if, but here's now, in that context, therefore our lives must involve suffering, humiliation, and death because those, because Gain comes out of loss because life comes out of death because reigning comes out of suffering. Is that, is that, did the Bible not declare those things? And the answer is, yeah, the Bible does declare that. Okay, But stepping out of the realm of the original and just stepping over here and saying, well, if you're a Christian, you're, there's going to be suffering and humiliation and death is not the truth. And most preachers would cringe at even somebody suggesting that, wouldn't they? Okay. I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting Christ. I'm suggesting Christ become our life. That's all I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting that if he becomes our life, there's a pattern that he lives that is selfless, that will end up you choosing to suffer so that someone else might reign, so that you choose to lose so that someone else might gain, so that you choose to go into death so that resurrection might be more abundant. Does that make sense? But not to choose that by an act of your will, but to choose the one to be your life who will be that way. You choose him, he'll make the right decisions. Don't choose to do the pattern. Choose the one who always flows in a certain pattern. We've never even fully, in next class I'll get into Epaphroditus and I hope maybe a little bit of Philemon to show this reality. I wanted to go to another book, uh, but, you know, well, before I get, get teaching that. Let me finish this. Um, uh, Therefore, our lives must involve suffering, humiliation, and death. We will only enter this if we have the true faith that gives hope in death. But there are some who expect a coming of Christ with no death and an exaltation 
with no humiliation. And, you know, God knoweth what I could share with you about the place of humiliation. Because, see, we all want to be humble, but nobody wants to be humiliated. I mean, I don't want to be humiliated, but I want the Lord. And when the Lord lives in me, I find that I've embraced things that I never would have embraced before. Not because, you know, Reverend Randy Nussbaum taught it at the Bible school or at the church. It's just, you know, it's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous. You shouldn't be following any man's teaching. You should follow the Lord. Yes, God gave us teachers till we all come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. All right, so uh, this, this thing of humiliation, I, I could, there's so much to it, and yet that, that, is a very scary part because death somehow we can I, I don't know how we get away with that you know because de even the death of the cross if you know anything about the cross and what Jesus went through the mocking and the mistreatment anyway all of that humiliation is all in that <clears throat> and a lot of times when it comes down to humiliation I'm out. You know what I mean? We're in a card game. <laughs> We're in a card game where I'm out. You know? Just don't deal me in this hand. Excuse me for those holy that have never played cards, but I used to play cards a lot in my BC days, and I, and I did. All right, I'm going to finish this right here, even though, you know. Uh, a prayer for more life is futile apart from a participation in his death. For Christ's sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, Paul said. For Christ's sake, and, he, and he, here's, here's what he means, for Christ's sake. For Christ's sake, I, to gain Christ. When he says, I've, for Christ's sake, I've suffered the loss, right? You know that? For Christ, and we go, yes, for Christ's sake, I will to. No, for Christ's sake, to gain this Christ that he's been describing in chapter 1 and chapter 2. This is chapter 3 I'm quoting now. But I'm trying to show he never, he never leaves the theme throughout this whole book. He never does. <clears throat> for Paul, the intervention of God comes after a death. This is God's response to suffering by Christ. All right? By identifying in his death and ours with him on the cross, it sets, up, it sets, set, sets us up to experience humiliation in our life because we are dead. Christ is our life, and we cannot react contrary to his life within us. Romans 6, 5 says, talks about being raised to new life. If you are raised to new life, it demands this because this is that new kind of life. It's completely new. It's not better or it's not, it is a new kind of life and it's a selfless giving life. It's what we're raised up into. We were dead in our old man. We're raised up into this. We always think that's, we're getting away from it by death. Resurrection put a smack dab in the middle of it. We're in Christ. I mean, it did, it did, it did, it did. I mean, there's no getting around it. If, if you comprehend, you know, what, what uh, Paul's talking about in Romans 6. Notice in verse 4, 5, we are not raised to heaven but to new life. And that is just big, big, big when the Holy Spirit shows you that because you'll be reading along and every time it talked about resurrection, you'd always think raised to heaven or, you know, that sort of thing. And he says, no, your resurrection was first a new life. And this new life looks just like the original because it is the original. All right, let's take a break and we'll come back for the last, the last slash. <laughs>